namaste to everyone uh, so we will start with guru vandana agyanati mirandhasya gyanan janashalakaya chakshurun militam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha om sahana vavatu sahana bhunaktu sahaviryam karavavahai tejasvinavadhitamastu mavidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Namaste everyone. My name is Uma Vashishta. Uh, I live in Indiana, USA. And today, in today's session, we are going to be talking about uh, Vedantic understanding of body, mind, and consciousness. So uh, Vedanta, um, the prayojanam of Vedanta is moksha or liberation. So to attain moksha, a Vedantin tries to understand who am I and tries to understand the nature of the self. And that leads to understanding the body, the mind, the consciousness. So even though the prayojanam of Vedanta is to attain moksha and to understand the path for moksha, so the means um, to the end, so that is how they reach there, that leads to the understanding of the body, mind, and consciousness, and all the various components, the working of them, and everything. So what that does is that gives everyone um, a good understanding of the body, mind, and consciousness, which we can all use um, in day-to-day -day life um, which will help lead a fulfilling life in day-to-day -day activities and day-to-day -day transactions. So um, it is really helpful in giving a, a overall understanding to everyone on the body, mind, and consciousness. So today we are going to be looking at two foundational questions. Who am I? And why am I born in this world as me? So why as me, um, not as somebody else, not as some, some other jiva, some other being. So who am I and why am I born as this individual? So those are the two questions we are going to be looking at today. So the first inquiry, who am I? So this leads to the understanding of the signs of body, mind, emotions, intellect, consciousness. The second inquiry, why am I born in this world as me? This inquiry leads to the understanding of the cause and effect, actions and their results. So what action uh, takes place has some result. And so understanding that cause and effect. So that inquiry helps in understanding that part. So we are going to be starting with the first inquiry, who am I? So um, as human beings, we all always um, have a lot of questions in our minds. Who do I want to be? As, as a child, we think, who do I want to be when I grow up? And then who's my role model? What do I want to accomplish? And then as we grow, we always think, what do I like? How do I feel? Where do I want to work? What do I, so this I, who is this I? So what do we refer to when we say as I? So does that I mean the name? Like when I say I'm Uma. So is it just my name or my family? Or when I say um, my education or my profession, when I say I'm an engineer. So is that who I am or when I say, uh, who am I? Am I the body or the mind, the emotion or the intellect or the consciousness? So there are various aspects. So we are going to take a look at them. Um, first of all, am I my name, my family, education, profession? So these um, we know kind of when we think a little more, we think, a human being existed even before the person got a name and uh, came to know his family, his or her family, um, even before they got an education or they got uh, the profession that they are in. 
So even before that, the person existed. So definitely, who am I is not any of those. Those are just attributes that are added to that person. Am I the body then? Let's take a look at that. Am I the body? So the physical body that we see is called the sthula sharira. So sthula is the gross, uh, sthula sharira. So the gross body that we see, um, that we do actions, do activities throughout the day, and um, that sthula sharira is only one out of three shariras, according to our Shastra. So we are looking at the Vedanta Shastra and overall this is, um, so these concepts, most of them are across all the Shastras. So when we see those, the gross body is only one out of the three Sharirani. And then it is only one out of the five Koshas. So what are the rest? What are the other two Shariras and the other four Koshas? So um, if there are any questions, um, Amit Ji has uh, uh, been kind enough to um, help um, handle the chat um, window. Any questions that come in that? And Jainthi Bhagini is also um, kindly uh, helping with that. So please uh, feel free to post the questions. Um, and uh, any questions uh, we have, we will be taking um, when we take a pause. Um, or towards the end, we will be addressing that. Just wanted to mention that. And then, so the grass body is only one out of the three shariras and only one out of the five koshas. So what are the rest of them? So we will be um, introspecting, inspecting them one by one. So starting with the sthula sharira, so the grass body. So the grass body, according to our Shastras, is made out of food that we eat. And we all know that. So every being eats and that's what makes up the body, the, the sthula sharira. So the, that's why the sthula sharira is called the annamaya, annamaya kosha. Anna is food. So it's made of food, annamaya kosha. So that, that is simple. Then comes the sukshma sharira. Sukshma is subtle. It is subtler than the sthula sharira. So that's why it's called the sukshma sharira. And what are the components there? The first one is the prana. Prana is the life force. So we breathe in, the life force uses that through the air. It creates all the subtle movements inside our body. All the pranas work and that's, uh, that's what enhances and enables us to do all the activities and the thoughts and everything that we do throughout our life. That is the pranamaya. Manomaya and the vigyanamaya are the other two koshas. Kosha is it's, uh, like a layer or a sheath. That's what um, is called the kosha. And why it is called a layer or a covering? So just like how um, something is kept inside a kosha, so something is kept covered. So that's that's how these are named as kosha. And what is kept covered, we will we will find. So the the third and fourth are the manomaya and vigyanamaya koshas. So those two together make our mind system, and we will be looking at that in great detail in the upcoming slides. The third sharira we have is the karana sharira. This is called the causal body or the karana sharira. It is also called the ananda maya kosha. Ananda is for bliss. Like when we experience um, or when we feel, when we think that we had a blissful sleep, like when we are in deep sleep. So that is the state of this Anandamaya Kosha or bliss. We will be looking at that in more detail also in an upcoming slide. So these are the, the five Koshas and the three Shariras that we have. So um, we know that we are not the grass body. We are not the Anandamaya Kosha. Uh, prana is the life force that we use throughout our life. So we are not that. 
in Mano Maya and Vijnana Maya. So the mind system. So are we those? Let's take a look. So the mind system. So this is uh, Mano Maya and Vijnana Maya koshas put together. So put together, they make the Antakaranam. Antakaranam literally means the internal instrument. So Anta is inside or internal. Karanam is an instrument. So literally, this is an instrument. So Manomaya and Vijnanamaya together, they form, they make up the Antakaranam. Or basically, the Antakaranam makes has these two components, these two uh, parts, or it transforms into those parts. We will see that. So what is in these Manomaya and Vijnanamaya koshas? So what are there? So Manomaya has two um, functions and Vijnanamaya has two functions. And these just transform into those faculties and perform that function. Just like how a human being uh, can be a, a mother, a sister, a daughter, various different roles. Like that, the Antakarana just transforms into all these different roles. The Mana, Ahankara, Buddhi, and Chitta. So there is an internal instrument called that is the antakarana and that transforms into mana, ahankara, buddhi and chitta. So based on what it needs to perform. So that is the idea here. So what do you mean, what do we mean by it transforms? So mana, let's take a look at mana. Mana is defined as sankalpa vikalpatmika antakarana vrittihi. So when we say antakarana vrittihi, that literally means a modification of the antakarana. So the mana is basically the antakarana modified to do this function. So what is that function? So the mana connects with the sense organs, so the organs of perception, sense perception. So the perception of sight, hearing, touch, smell, so all these sense perceptions, they do not work without the mana. So the mana has to connect with them. Like for example, I'm looking at the computer. I see the computer, but if my mind is not there, if my mind is not connected with the perception of sight, even though my eyes are open, I see it, but I don't perceive it. Like another example would be when somebody is talking to me or when somebody calls and the words are falling in my ears, but I don't perceive it because my mind was somewhere else. And my mind is not connected with the perception of hearing. So when that happens, then we don't perceive that particular, um, through that particular sense organ. So the, the, the five senses, so they work with the manaha. The manaha has to connect with the sense organs for us to be able to perceive those perceptions. So what other things the manaha does? So sankalpa vikalpa. So sankalpa is when we say we want to do something or when we think, when a thought occurs that I want to sing, I want to do something, I want to eat, I want to some things that we want to, we do a sankalpa or we kind of uh, think, contemplate, like, is this, or do I need do, is this an apple or is this not, or things like that towards the outside world and things towards the inside also, like I'm thinking this or this, things like that. So it is both ways. 
So the mana is the one that kind of talks, helps us be connected to the outside world as well as with the inside to understand our sankalpa and vikalpa. So that is the mana. Then we have the ahankaraha. Ahankaraha, ahankaroti iti ahankaraha. So it's the I thing. So abhimanatmika antakarana vritti. Abhimanatmika. So it is kind of giving a, um, a perception, um, making a self-conscious. So kind of this is the computer that I see and this is me. So I see the computer. So I know that this is a computer or I'm doing this, giving that the I-ness. So somebody else is seeing the computer, I see the computer. So giving that identity or differentiation from all the rest. So that is the ahankara. And every living being has this, and this is a primary thing. It is not the, the ego or in common sense what, what is ahankara. It is not literally that. It is just an identity or just giving this um, entity uh, differentiation from the rest. And it is for that entity to basically see that difference. Like this is I am seeing or I see the computer. So like, for example, I see an object. I see an apple, for example. I look at the apple. I, I see that there is an object. So at that time, the mana is connecting with my sense perception of sight and actually perceiving that object. So what it does is it projects that shape of the apple inside the mind. So the antakarna transforms and projects that apple in that entire antakarna. And this ahankara part is the one that, oh, I see an apple, I see, that is that. So there is an apple, but now I know that I see that apple. So that I part, understanding that I part, that is the ahankara. And then there is the buddhi. Buddhi is part of the vijnana maya kosha. It is a little more subtler than the mana because this is not now talking to the outside world. This is talking to the, this is only in, towards inside. So this is defined as nishchayatmika antakarana vritti. So what does that mean, nishchayatmika? So when I look at the apple, I see it, the mind projects that apple in the antakarana. So there is that projection. And then the buddhi is the one that is deterministic. This is an apple. So it determines. So that projection is used by the buddhi and it determines that that is, that is what this is for what we perceive. And again, like what the thoughts that come from inside the mind, like, should I do this action? Should I not do this action? Things like that. Again, it's projected and the buddhi is the one that determines, yes, I want to do this. I should do this or do this or don't do this. So that deterministic factor comes from the buddhi part of the antakarana. So the fourth one is the chitta. That is called the anusandhanatmika antakarana vritti. So that is more like an inquiry, like it does a search, for example. So it retrieves the data. And so this works like retrieving from a memory store. So that's all the memory from the past is stored and the chitta is the antakarana vritti or the internal instruments modification that works to retrieve that information from the past. So that's like the acting like the faculty of the memory store. So putting together all of them. So we have the manaha, ahankara, buddhi, and chitta. 
So all of these are vrittis of, vritti is like a modification or transformation. So modification, all these are transformation of the antakarana. Just that one instrument, it gets transformed into all of these. So how does that happen? So does it transform into the mana and then transform into the ahankara or, or does it all happen simultaneously? Are these all two like multiple parts? So the Shastras say an example. It transforms so fast that we cannot um, identify that it is connected to this or this. It is, it is very fast. It happens very seamlessly. Like for example, a laukika example, a worldly example. So like the same example as the apple. So I see the apple. So there is an object in front of me. I see that there is an object. So the mind connects with the sense perception of sight. I look at the apple. The mind projects the apple inside the, the, that object in, in my mana. So that time the antakarana is a mana, the vritti as the mana. And then the buddhi sees that and it is an apple. It is deterministic. The ankara, oh, I see the apple. So how did the buddhi know that this is an apple? Because the chitta had previous memories. So at that time, the chitta says, hey, this is what an apple looks like. So it retrieves that information and the buddhi determines that it is an apple. So all this happens within fractions of seconds. And then now the mana says, oh, I want to eat the apple, it thinks. And then the buddhi, should I eat the apple or not? So the buddhi determines and the chitta immediately brings memories. Oh, the, this color apple was sour or this was sweet. Oh, this is good or bad or things like that from the past memories or and all of this put together constitutes the thought and the actions throughout the day that we do. So how this works, the Shastra has given example. So if we take a thousand petals and we take a needle and Put the needle through the thousand petals even though it feels like it went with, with through the thousand petals within fraction within a fraction of seconds the needle still has to go through each one of those petals one by one so similarly the antakarana transforms into all of this throughout the day and this happens one by one, even though it happens really, really fast and happens seamlessly, we don't realize that at all. So if we think of it, there is really not anything called multitasking with our mind. It is all single threaded and it happens so efficiently that we do not even realize that. I hope um, that makes um, sense and it is um, helpful. Um, let's take a pause for a minute and see if there are any questions. Uh, Bhagini, there is one query which I have, we have not yet answered. Maybe you can take that. It says, can bad memories of past be erased? The uh, remaining questions we have answered. If there are okay. any pending, I'll collect it at the end and I'll uh, relate to you. But this one you want so, to take? Sure. So bad memories of past. So the memories are stored and we, um, the mana, antakarana, buddhi, chitta do work with those memories. So if we want to erase a bad memory, we can use the knowledge of the, this, identify that that is a bad memory and consciously work through it. Or later, 
if we get a good memory, it, it gets erased. Like for example, if we have um, a bad experience um, going to a shop, for example, um, I did not get the item that I was looking for. So next time, oh, I'm not going to go to that shop. Understanding that, hey, this is just the chitta or the, the memory that is the, the samskara. Samskara is the, um, so when we have some experience that creates um, that memory, the, the samskara, that is called the samskara. So it is coming from that samskara. Hey, why don't I give it a try again? Or maybe it will be available this time. So consciously making that probably helps. So that, um, the, the shastras um, say a lot about um, the experiences are the same. It is the, our perception, the perspective with which uh, the human being look at, that is the one that actually um, helps handle that experience. So uh, that is the reason a person put in one experience may handle it different than another person put in that same experience and so on. So I hope that uh, that helps. And yes, um, there are um, in Shastra, there are Prayaschitta Karma, um, like uh, Haridas Ji mentioned. So um, there are like Nitya Karma, Naimittika Karma and Prayaschitta Karma. I can talk a little bit about that, that may help. So Nitya Karma is the daily um, duties or daily karma that uh, have been told or that, that we as human beings or any um, living being perform. And Naimittika Karma is, um, it, there are karmas, there are actions that are performed um, during a certain uh, times or certain um, triggered by some certain activities. So like Naimittika Karma is when like a baby is born, the baby is given a name and uh, the, the ceremony happens and so on. So there are Naimittika Karmas. And then Prayaschitta Karma is when um, something um, bad or some something uh, we we have done some action which whose results are not very good. So some prayaschitta can be done according to the shastras. That is a prayaschitta karma. So that that is um, also said in the shastras. But a practical way, if we want to work through the mind is to understand the, the four aspects of the mind and um, kind of be aware when, when we are, which is, which is very hard. And, uh, but there are um, ways mentioned for Chitta Shuddhi and all that. Like I said, um, these are very useful for attaining moksha, the path of uh, liberation, but it is also extremely useful in leading a fulfilling life by um, adjusting the perceptions or adjusting the um, how we um, make use of an experience or perceive things. So that, I hope that that helps. So we will move to the next, um, slide here. So we talked about the Sthula Sharira. We talked about the Sukshma Sharira. So we are, um, so who am I? I'm not, neither of those. So where is consciousness? We have not talked about that yet. So we are not, um, so consciousness is not the body, the, the mind, the, the intellect or the, the memory and all that. So where is consciousness? So we did not talk in detail about the Anandamaya Kosha yet. So what about the Anandamaya Kosha? Is that the consciousness? That is the Karana Sharira. So let's think about that. So for that, we need to understand how 
our body and mind behave when we are awake and when we are asleep. So we will take a look at the three states of being. So the first one is the waking state. So when we are awake. So what happens when we are awake is the sthula sharira is active. The sukshma sharira is active. So when I say that, I mean the gross body is moving around doing its activity. Even when we are just lying around, not asleep, tossing and turning, even then the gross body is still working. So it is active. The sukshma sharira, the mind throughout the day, it is active. The mind is active constantly. So all of them are active. The karan sharira is subtler than the subtle body. So it is active throughout the day, but we don't realize that in all this, um, just like how when there is a slight noise and there is a bigger noise and bigger noise, we don't hear that, that slight little noise until the others calm down. So that's the technique we are going to use to figure out what this Karana Sharira is and what it does. So the Sukshma Sharira, the mind. So it is active during the, during the waking state. What happens when we are sleeping? So when we sleep, there is a state called the dream state. We, we are asleep, but then there are dreams. So what happens that time? The mind takes all the things that it has perceived or it has projected from um, associating with the sense uh, perceptions throughout the day or in the past, past memories, everything. So the Manomaya, Vigyanamaya, Kosha, so they basically, the, it takes all the past memories and whatever it has perceived. So even though the Sthula Sharira is not active, so we are asleep, the Sthula Sharira is not active. So the sense perceptions are not active right now. They, they are not um, looking outside towards the outside world. But the mana has these samskaras in, um, inside. So the mana is able to pull those in, that information and project. So it projects and that is what comes as dreams. So it is from all the um, samskaras or impressions, everything from the past and what the mana has collected using the, the, the sense perception and projected inside. And that is all the things that comes out and um, gets projected again in the, in the dreams. So that is the manomaya and vijnanamaya which are active in this um, dream state. So what happens um, when the, we are past the dream state and when we are in deep sleep? At that time, there is literally no dreams. The sthula sharira is not doing anything. The sukshma sharira is not doing anything. So what happens then? Only the Karana Sharira or Ananda Maya Kosha is active. And there is bliss. How do we know that? So when we wake up out of the deep sleep, so when a person is in deep sleep, they don't have any experience of how it feels at that time. When the person wakes up, when the person comes back from the deep sleep all the way to the waking state, the person remembers, I had a blissful sleep last night, but I don't remember anything. So after a deep sleep, one recalls, I had a blissful sleep, but I don't remember anything. So what does that mean? That Ananda Mayakosha it has some bliss, it, it, it is full of bliss, but it does not remember, it does not um, know what actually happened. Who am I, who I was at that time? Because it is a layer of ignorance. That's what our Shastras say. What do we mean by a layer of ignorance? 
And this is the one that kind of covers the consciousness. So there is consciousness right under this layer. So in deep sleep state, we literally go very close to that consciousness. That's why there is bliss. But because of the ignorance, there is unconsciousness also. So it's a mixture and we don't remember anything. So that is the Anandamaya Kosha. The example that is given by the Shastras is, so there is the sun. Sun is full of brightness. There is a patch of cloud. Even though the patch of cloud is very little, it covers the sun. And we don't perceive, we don't see the sun or we don't feel that brightness. But when the patch of cloud moves away, then we can perceive the sun or we can see the sun. So that is the consciousness and the Anandamaya Kosha covering it. And that's why they are called the sheets or the koshas. So the Anandamaya Kosha covers it. A little more outside is the Vigyanamaya, Manomaya, and then Pranamaya. And outermost is the Annamaya. So when we say outermost, it's from gross to subtle. So Sthula Sharira, subtler than that is the Sukshma Sharira, subtler than that is the Karan Sharira, and then there is this consciousness. So that is the, the whole being of what we are. So um, consciousness is actually the self. And then it is covered by all these layers. And when we say that I am Uma. So I'm literally associating with the name. Or when I say I am tall or I am short, I'm literally going with how the Annamaya Kosha looks like or associating or relating with that. Or when I say that I am um, hungry or I am feeling sad or happy or something like that, my feelings, my emotions, that time, I'm perceiving, I'm relating to the Manomaya or Vijnanamaya. So at that level. And then, oh, I'm full of bliss or I'm blissful or something like that. That is the Anandamaya Kosha. But in deep sleep state, when we actually feel that, when we have that bliss, we don't actually remember that. That is not an experience. But after we wake up, we remember. So that is the reason of the that, that is the that is because of the ignorance or the unconsciousness so when um according to the shastras when the chitta shuddhi uh, is done the yoga um different stages are done and samadhi is attained the mind so uh, the yama niyama asana pranayama dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. And then the samadhi at that state, when the mind is gone deeper and deeper in each of these states, dharana is like the one um, threadedness. Um, dhyana is like the un undivided, the meditation, um, focus uh, undivided uh, kind of concentration and meditation. And then, um, reaches the samadhi. So that time the mind is fully um, in that consciousness and it is actually not asleep at that time. It is still like in the waking state, but except all these other bodies are not active. It's full, full of consciousness. And that is the reason at that time, they actually, it is called the Turiya state. That is the fourth state. And that is when the consciousness is also act, it's fully um, active, they can experience that. So that is the, the way uh, they have actually uh, experienced this. So how does Vedanta prove consciousness? So some of these very subtle things, they are not perceived by Pratyaksha. 
or the uh, direct perception. So this is more, it is subtle and uh, subtler and subtler. So how do, how do they prove this? They use three things. Shruti, it's what is said in the Vedas or the Shruti, Yukti or reasoning. And Anubhava, Anubhava is experience. So if we look at the Shrutis, so Pratyag Asthulaha, Achakshuhu, Apranaha, Amanaha, Akarta, Chaitanyam, Chinmatram, Sad. So the self is not gross. It is without the senses, the vital force, the mind. It's not the agent, but consciousness. So this is said in the Shruti. And if we look at Yukti or logic or reasoning, so we can see in the past uh, inquiry that we went through, everything except consciousness is only material. It, they're all unreal, like the pot. They, uh, when we say unreal, they all come and go. So the, the sthula sharira is here, it, it goes. It's made out of food and then it becomes food for some, some other being. So the sukshma sharira also merges and so on. So everything except the consciousness is unreal. And everything is illuminated by the consciousness. So they have systematically um, shown the logic and proven this. So that is the yukti. We went through in a very high level, but if we look at um, the scriptures and the, the shastras, the, there are step-by-step um, -step explanation and uh, uh, proofs of all of this. And then Anubhava. The realized individuals, like I said, in the meditation, Samadhi, they have uh, realized and they have shared their personal experiences that the nature of self is consciousness. So Vedanta uses the Shruti, Yukti and the Anubhava to prove that um, consciousness is who I am. So if that is the case, then in the Upanishads or in the Shrutis, uh, in our um, Shastras, we, we have a lot of references that relate me or the Atma to um, the Pranamaya or Manomaya um, or I am my son. Like my, if I'm, if my son is very dear to me, it's like I am him. Basically, I see myself in my son. So things like that. So why are there different variations or the, the Atma or the self is associated with all these different things in different places? Why is that? So um, to explain that, um, how they explain is, like if we want to show a subtle star so this is called the Arundhati Nyaya. So if we want to show a subtle star, we just don't go directly, hey, you see that? That is the subtle star that I want to show or something like that. Instead, we show the, the grossest thing and then a little more subtler thing, subtler thing, subtler thing. So we show like the tree and you see the moon and next to it is the the big star there and next to it is that little star and things like that. So we go from gross to subtle. So like that, starting with the outside world. So I am that, so it's something that I can perceive. And then I'm this body, this prana, the mana, the, the vijnana maya, the ananda maya, and then the consciousness. So going step by step. So taking the student um, of Vedanta from the grossest to the subtlest so that they can understand step by step. So that is what the Shastras do. So that's why we see 
all these varying associations of atma with various aspects of us. So before we move to the second inquiry of why am I born in this world as me, let's take a little pause and see again if there are any, any questions. Uh, Bhagini, there was one question about uh, which I think you have uh, more or less answered about the different states, uh, conscious, superconscious, subconscious and all that. And also mm -hmm. about the uh, how they map to the or and is there a mapping of the brain states uh, like uh, alpha, beta, gamma, etc. So that was the question. I am not very proficient with the brain states. Uh, I won't be able to comment on that, but I think there are a lot of research um, that one could um, find. Yeah, as far as I am aware, uh, there is a mapping between the brain states as measured by um, tapping into the brain and the different states uh, ranging from active uh, awake to the uh, mm -hmm. Turiya that she mentioned. Uh, so there's a, but I don't uh, often know which uh, state refers to what, but definitely there is a mapping. Right. Yeah, I'm not an expert in that. Um, so I would, uh, I agree that there is, there is mapping and there is a lot of um, research and articles out there. So that is a good question. Could uh, probably um find out uh, more information from uh, valid sources, probably. Okay, so we will move to the next uh, inquiry. So why am I born in this world as me? So this is a two part question. So why birth in the first place? And then why birth as a specific individual? So why are beings born in this world? And the second part of the question is, why are those beings born as those beings in that environment and not as somebody else? So the first part of the question was, why birth? So the reason for birth, according to our uh, Shastras, is to experience the fruits of the karma, of the past karma. So what does that mean? So every action that is done has a karma associated with it. So action is called karma and the fruit or the result of that action, whether it is a good result or a bad result, that is called a karma also. So that karma is of three types. So types of karmani. So all the good and bad done by that jiva or that um, atma or that self throughout all the different births. So first of all, Vedanta Shastra and um, all the Astika Shastras, or Astika Darshanani, they all um, acknowledge the um, the punarjanma, the, the cycle of birth and death, and um, a jiva goes through multiple births. So the sanchita karma is all the sum total of all the good and bad results that the self has accumulated throughout all the different janmas or different births. So that is the Sanchita Karma. And a little portion of it that has ripened and is available or it is uh, allocated for this next birth, for this next um, life of this uh, the self is called the Prarabdha. So this is a little portion of the Sanchita Karma. So it is given to this Jiva. 
and this uh, jiva goes through um, exhausting that prarabdha karma, lives through that. So whatever uh, good, bad results are in that prarabdha karma, so he or she or that being goes through that throughout this life. And then in this life, again, this jiva is still doing actions. And that gives good or bad results. And that again adds to the karma. So that gets added, that keeps getting accumulated, and that is called the agami karma. So the sanchita, of which a small portion is allocated, that is what the jiva goes through throughout this life. And then in this life, the jiva keeps doing actions which add more karma, and that is called the agami karma. And the agami karma, in turn, goes and gets added to that big bucket of sanchita karma. So this is the, uh, these are the three uh, karmani, and this goes on and on. And again, um, from that, um, a little portion that has ripened is again allocated for this jiva's next um, life. And then again, that jiva accumulates agami karma and goes on back to the sanchita, adds more, and it keeps going. So that um, answers why birth. So in order to exhaust all that um, karma, so the jiva takes lives many, many, many lives. That is the, um, that is what our Shastras say. The second part of the question, why birth as a specific individual? So for experiencing the Sukham, Dukham, etc., and all that, from the good, bad, karma, phala. So if there is something good, that jiva will be experiencing something good. If there is a bad uh, karma, the jiva will be experiencing something, um, some dukkha. So, and so on. So this experience can happen only when that self has a shariram. When I say shariram, it's basically the sthula, sukshma, and karana sharira, and this whole whole package. So, for that, he he or she or that that jiva needs a a sharira. So, atmanaha bhoga yatanam sharira. So, the we uh, talked about how the mind works, and the mind is the thing that perceives, and the sense perceptions are the ones that connect to the outside world. And um, in order to uh, put the, uh, that feeling, the atma connects with the mind, the mind connects with the perceptions and it, the whole thing works. So this entire system is needed for experiencing and exhausting all that karma. So a shariram is needed. So why uh, a specific individual then? So the shariram, is determined according to the prarabdha karma. So based on what kind of prarabdha karma this jiva is supposed to be exhausting in this life, based on that, the sharira is determined. We'll see that in a little more detail. So the karma cycle. So we have the sanchita karma, the big, bucket of all the sum total of all the karmas throughout all the different uh, janmas, different births, everything that has been accumulated is the sanchita karma. And from that, a small portion is allocated. Some small portion that has ripened is allocated as the prarabdha karma. And now this prarabdha karma what kind of a shariram or body is needed to go through this prarabdha karma? Like for example, all the trees or all the animals or birds, every jiva, bacteria, every jiva goes through the prarabdha karma. 
or exhaust the prarabdha karma. But human beings are the ones who can accumulate more of the agami karma. Like for example, animals, if we take, they just do their basic necessities. They don't have as much um, of transactions as what humans do. So they do not have the opportunity to accumulate agami karma. So their life or their janma is to exhaust the prarabdha karma that is given in that life. So, and so on. So if the prarabdha, depending on the prarabdha karma, the nature of that prarabdha karma that has ripened and that is allocated to that jiva, depending on that, they will get a shariram, which is like a bird or a fish or a, a plant or a human or any, there, there are millions of species we know. So this, these are just a few uh, pictures just for representing, but there are millions of species from which that uh, shariram is selected. And like, so this jiva is now going to be born as a tiger as a dog, as a human being. And then even in that, a tiger in the zoo versus a tiger in the forest, a human being in a certain environment, a human being in a different environment, and all this whole thing, all that logic goes there based on the prarabdha karma that has ripened. So shariram is determined. So let's assume this is a human being and this human being does actions throughout this life. And based on that actions, they again accumulate good or bad karma. And that is the agami karma. And that goes back into the sanchita karma. So this, at the end of this life, again, the prarabdha karma is allocated for the next life and go, goes on and on and on. So this cycle keeps continuing. So this is the, the cycle. So how do we break this cycle of karma? If the cycle keeps going on and on and on, the cycle can be broken only if the sanchita is exhausted there is no agami that is accumulated and there is the prarabdha is exhausted. So what do the Shastras say about that? So realization of the self. So the chitta shuddhi and uh, all that leading to moksha or liberation. So that is going to liberate that self. So what does that mean? So the liberated person has dispelled all ignorance and its effects. So what does that mean, ignorance? So the layer of um, Anandamaya. So that is the ignorance layer. So when we say dispelled ignorance, so basically he or she, that, that liberated person has the consciousness or views the consciousness all the time and they are in that state. So that is what is dispelling the ignorance and its effects. And what that does, that destroys all the sanchita karma, all the past karmas. So in the Shastras, it is said that the, all the sanchita, all the all those karmas become like dagda bija, all uh, like burnt seeds. So there is no nothing, no results or nothing comes out of that. It is all burnt. So the sanchita gets burnt or exhausted. There are no doubts or errors. So since they are. Um, always illuminated by this consciousness, their actions will be such that they are not accumulating any agami karma. They do not accumulate any agami karma um, through their 
actions. What about the prarabdha karma? The person still has to experience and exhaust the prarabdha karma. Why is that? So the Shastras say that um, it is like an arrow that is already shot. So the arrow hits the target and even if it hits the target, it does not stop right there. It still goes further until the momentum comes to a zero. Until it is completely, it has exhausted that momentum and then it falls. Right, similar to that arrow. So the prarabdha has already started. Prarabdha. It is already, um, the arabdha has happened. So it, it is already shot. So it goes through. And even after that liberation, it still continues until the prarabdha is exhausted. So what does that mean? So the person uh, is in this particular environment, goes through all these experiences, they are liberated, meaning they are seeing this consciousness all the time and seeing um, and doing their actions with that awareness and no more, no Sanchita Karma, no Agami Karma, but the person still has to do their daily things. They still have to, um, if for example, in their Prarabdha Karma, they, it is there that, okay, this person is not going to get a meal for this one day, or he's going to have, um, he's going to starve this one day. He goes through that. So that is the Prarabdha Karma experience. So they go through that, but yet not attaching themselves or they do that free from attachments. So they are not accumulating any more Agami Karma, but they are exhausting the Prarabdha Karma. So when they do that, eventually when the Prarabdha is completed, then they, they don't have any more further birth and death. So they are out of the, that karma cycle. So uh, there is a, a shloka in uh, Mundaka Upanishad, Bhityate hrudaya granthihi, chidyante sarva samshayaha, kshiyante cha asya karmani, tasmin drishte paravare. So Bhityante is the breaking, the hrudaya granthihi, the, the knot the heart. So the Hrudaya Granthihi Bhidyate means basically um, it is to say that this um, jiva is uh, broken from all the bondages or there is no more time, no more um, that, uh, that bondage or um, he's liberated. Chidyante Sarva Samshayaha. So Samshayaha, the doubts. So all the doubts are solved. So basically they are aware of the consciousness all the time and they are doing their actions, seeing that consciousness in others also and doing the transactions in that way. So they, they don't have any doubts. Kshiyantecha Asya Karmani. So all the, the past karmas or all of those karmani, they all kshiyante, they all get diminished. Tasmin drishte paravare. So when the realization occurs, then all these karmas go away and that person gets liberated and no more um, birth and death. So these people who are liberated and still live through their prarabdha karma, they are called the Jivan Muktas. So they are, they are Mukta and still they are uh, Jivanti. So they are Jivan Mukta. And then once the Prarabdha is exhausted, then that's it. They don't have any more birth and death. So they are outside. They are out of this, uh, this cycle. So they, they don't have any more Sanchita, no more uh, Agami, and they have fully exhausted the the current, the prarabdha that already started. So that is all exhausted. So this whole thing is done. So no more birth and death for that uh, jiva. So that is the um, karma cycle and breaking of the karma cycle. 
So uh, we started with uh, the questions, who am I? And why am I born in this world as me? So I'm consciousness. And why am I born in this world is to experience the results of the karma, the past accumulated karma. And why am I born as this individual? is because of the, the prarabdha. And this is the body, this is these, this is the shariram, the, the sthula, sukshma, karana sharirani, for exhausting that set of prarabdha karma. So that's why this individual in this particular environment. So when I say the exhausting the prarabdha karmani, they can be good karma, bad karma, any of those. So just, they have to, get exhausted so that that's the idea so that um is both of those uh inquiries and um if there are any questions So if there are any, uh, we have tried to answer uh, whatever questions you have typed in the chat, but uh, if they are still unresolved, then please uh, raise your hand and we will, um, we will take those questions one by one. So there was, uh, so Donald Patel ji has your question about uh, how to um, break out of causality, uh, which is caused by the sanskara. Is, I think that was answered uh, by Bhagini when she talked about this moksha concept, I suppose. But if it's still unclear, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask. Uh, namo Namo Bhagini. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Ma'am, I want to ask that uh, as, a par as a result of sanskaras we got uh, in this world, we become dual. We do not want to be dual. So what we can do to decrease that duality of ours? Thank you. So the duality um, about that, uh, there is a lot of um, information in the Shastras. So that is the um, different schools of Vedanta. So the Dvaita and Advaita and Vishishtadvaita. So the Dvaita looks at um, duality and the Advaita is the part that talks about um, the self is the same as the universal consciousness. So there is no duality. So that is just one level. Um, it is at the last um, step like I am this Jivatma. So when uh, we are realizing that, do the daily transactions and everything. But until that, everything is kind of common. And the moksha is kind of a little different. So that is basically um, the part that is um, given in all these different schools of Vedanta and how to reach um, that level of moksha, become one with the universal consciousness, become, um, reach that universal consciousness, but there is the duality, uh, still that is considered moksha. And in various schools, there are various different um, ideas. So um, that would be the, the um, dvaita to Advaita, the, the differences. Um, so, I think, <clears throat> just to add to that, but this irrespective of whether you believe in uh, which darshana, whether it is Advaita or Dvaita, I think the common theme, which, uh, for example, yoga talks about, is to do Chitta Shuddhi, uh, to yes. reduce the sanskaras in the Chitta uh, by raising our level of awareness through meditation, sadhana, yama niyama, through appropriate ahara, 
making sure we consume mm-hmm. clean food live uh, uh, you know clean uh, air water and food and have uh, uh, you know positive thoughts uh, engage right. in positive actions which uh, uh, help self and others rather than uh, out of uh, for example greed or something so in general live a, a positive balanced life and slow uh, through consciously reducing the um, um, the samskaras in the mind uh, uh, with with all the yoga sadhana is the overall uh, concept right so um to add to that um like how all these um shastras they work together so there is um the nyaya shastra that explains in great depth of all these different aspects of the mind the mana the the buddhi the all the perceptions and everything and then we have the the mimamsa shastra that tells all about how to do all the karmas the nitya naimitika uh, prashtita and everything like how do we do the karma and then um there is the vedanta shastra that gives all this jnana and then um there is the yoga that gives the uh, the practical um how do you uh, the chitta shuddhi nirodha that is the yoga right so how do you do the chitta shuddhi and that is the um the part that leads to the samadhi so um like amit ji mentioned so there is the uh, the eight steps in yoga that um starting with the yama the the five um um don'ts or um the the non um can call it non, non violence so ahimsa satya asteya um there are five and then there is a niyama there are five niyamas so shaucha um and so on and then there is um so following those um gives a good uh, guideline um to um lead a um um very uh, well disciplined life and then following those 10 and then um there is a yama uh, there there is a uh, asana and then asana is about uh, the posture and keeping a healthy body and then the pranayama pranayama is the um the um how do we uh, control the breath or uh, exercise the breath so uh, being aware of the breath so it kind of takes us to the just like how we walk through the outside body and then slowly slowly going all the way inward so the pranayama so making us aware of the breath throughout the day and doing all the activities with the breath awareness and then uh, pratyahara pratyahara is the controlling of all the senses so what do we mean by controlling of all the senses so if i'm um, as a student if i'm studying and then there is something that falls in my ears having the focus on what i'm doing or when i'm in a meeting um focusing on that and uh, having that kind of sense control sense um um getting that all inward instead of going outward so that is the first step pratyahara and then um there is dharana so one pointed um one pointedness so once we have the sense uh, perceptions controlled having that one point focus on the one thing um and then dhyana is the that undisturbed one point focus is the dhyana or meditation and then leading to samadhi so all these the practice and the sadhana um that is um thing and uh, in vedanta it is um said about uh, shravana manana and nididhyasa so shravana is constantly keep hearing um what uh, is said in the scriptures or any of that kind of information that will lead us to this uh, goal and then the manana is self reflection we keep constantly thinking about that and contemplating and thinking um reflecting on those that we uh, heard so hearing is just accumulating and reflecting on that and then nididhyasa is actually then um meditating and um actually attaining the the samadhi so that uh, kind of is the path that is told um how to become how to reach that moksha or become one um however we put it 
Uh, there's another interesting question by Dr. Naresh. Uh, what type of karma does the very first life or jiva have? Or what sharira does the very first jiva with no sanchit karma take? That is a very, very interesting uh, question. Uh, and there are different views on by different uh, right. shastras. For example, Nyaya doesn't uh, says that jivas are all eternal. There was never a first right. concept. Whereas Vedanta so says after from the Paramanu. Right. Whereas Vedanta, I think, says after a Mahapralaya, then all the jivas merge back. It all came from Ishwaricha. And right. there are different concepts how the first thing started. But the first thing started, and then there are karmas, and then there are that's. There are various different um, thoughts on that, like uh, Amitvarya mentioned also. And then Krishna Narayan Swamiji had a question saying, uh, is there a uh, exact mapping we can predict saying what karma leads to what uh, form of birth in the next janma, etc. Is there any guidelines or mapping like that saying if you do this, then this is what will happen. As far I... as I know, there are generic guidelines, but uh, what was, the, uh, I think what we can choose our uh, uh, appropriate actions, but in what, at what stage and in uh, with what sequence those uh, will right. fructify there is, is there up are... to Ishwaricha. It's not, uh, we can't, I think, have a very deterministic um, algorithm saying, if I right. do this, then after two uh, uh, janmas, this will happen. It's not, we don't have a mathematical formula for that as far as I know. Yeah. Right. I agree. Um, so as uh, guidelines, there are uh, in the Shastras definitely guidelines as to this will lead to good karma or this will lead to bad karma. This is nishiddha or not this, this is don't do's or this is uh, vihita or it has to be done. Things like that. So we kind of know that, hey, don't do that. It's, it's uh, like we can take like we are um, driving above the speed limit and um, we get caught by a cop. We don't know what fine or what they are going to charge us for, or, but we know that I did something that I'm not supposed to do, or am I within the speed limit or things like that. So it, there are um, do's and don'ts for what we should do and what we should not do, but what the result will be so we have like millions of um, the karmas in that Sanchita karma and what will be ripe and the, what will be presented as the uh, next birth that is not um, like exact one-to-one -one mapping. Yeah, and there was, uh, there was some questions uh, about uh, certain specific references from the Puranas. But I think that's slightly outside the scope of uh, Vedanta because that's uh, right. Purana is a different uh, uh, genre altogether. It, it is basically a con combination of uh, uh, symbolic um, narrative. I mean, there are there are uh, stories which are in symbolic form to uh, something. So we um, I don't know whether we should discuss that here. Right, that will be kind of a little bit out of um, out of scope for uh, this session, but uh, yeah. Paji, you like may I said, want to mention that uh, there are this uh, prastana traya, which are critical Vedanta texts, which should be the ones that we should follow rather than Purana as direct source. Yes, as far as Vedanta goes, um, it deals with the um, Upanishad, Brahma Sutra and the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, there are a lot of guidelines and examples and um, things in these. Um, like in the Upanishads also, there are a lot of stories and um, in each of those, and there are guidelines. So uh, about the Purana, so when um, a student of Vedanta uh, comes to a guru, the, the student has already gone through uh, the Veda, Vedanta, uh, Veda, Vedanga, uh, studies and um, uh, done a lot of all these uh, studies already and uh, he is uh, an aspirant for moksha and he goes to this guru uh, to learn Vedanta. So he already has that knowledge and it is further refined by the knowledge of um, the Upanishads, Brahma Sutra and um, Bhagavad Gita 
uh, by being with the guru and that is um, the shastric way of um, learning vedanta or the practicing vedanta and attaining the moksha so that is it's kind of all these uh, puranas shastras the shruti everything kind of goes hand in hand and uh, it is all uh, they all work together so it is said that the the um vedas uh, tell um do's and don'ts and things like uh, like a prabhu like um, like how it, it would give uh, a command um and say and uh, whereas the the puranas uh, the the stories they all tell like um hey um be like rama don't be like or things like that like just an example giving us examples of all the stories and like just like how we say um, oh be like like this neighbor uh, that that kid uh, how he got good grades and how he is listening to his parents and so things like that so it says like that the same concept but it says in a different way and then um, there are different um, levels so that's how um, all these uh, puranas and um, and then the upanishads um, is for a little more um, um, what do we say for a mind that has already studied all these things and come to upanishads now and um, come to the brahma sutras and the bhagavad gita and uh, to attain moksha so yes it, it is kind of all of this work together okay so i think if there are no further questions uh... We will thank Umaji for a very insightful presentation and thank all the participants for uh, having joined today. Hope you found this of value. And if you want to keep informed of future talks in the series, uh, most of you have already registered, but if you have not, then I'll put the link in the chat. Um, please uh, go and register there. Uh, that's where you will also receive by email the recording link for this talk as well as the presentation, the feedback form. And I will also save the chat transcript and ask the organizers to mail it out to everyone. So um, thank you, Amitji. And thank you. Uh, thanks, and thanks to, to all my, the organizers. Thanks to my classmates for pitching in with the and helping with the chat uh, uh, answers, uh, particularly Jayanti ji, uh, Anuj ji, and Haridas ji. Okay. Thank you so much. Amit ji, may I want to explicitly stop the recording?